In this podcast, we're going to talk about colligative properties of solutions. All right, a colligative property is one that depends on the concentration of particles in a solution, not upon the identity of the particles. So we don't really care, care what the properties of the particles are, we just care how many of them we have. And those things um, affect a couple of different things. One, boiling point. So um, the more you see, the higher the boiling point will become. Okay, freezing point. So the more the concentration, the lower the freezing point will be. Um, vapor pressure is also another one. So you see a lowering in vapor pressure, the more concentration or the more particles you have in a solution. And then the osmotic pressure also lowers. So these are several properties that are affected by the amount of particles that you have in a solution. All right, here you see um, a little bit more information about freezing point and boiling point. All right, here's a little animation at the top. I like Mr. Alligator. Um, remember that B becomes before F, so boiling point goes up, it increases, and the freezing point goes down, it decreases, okay? So each mole of solute particle is going to lower your freezing point of one kilogram of water by 1.86 uh, degrees Celsius, okay? And if you look in the picture down there, um, you see here a pure solvent, um, no solute mo mo molecules involved. And here you see one that has solute molecules in the red ones and in the green ones as well. So this one, they can easily shift between a uh, liquid and solid phase. So it's going to be much more easier to get them all to freeze. Okay, in this one, you see that you have um, these intermolecular forces of attraction occurring between the solute and the solvent. And so it's going to be harder to get it to all go into, um, for it to go back and forth, okay? To shift from liquid to solid phase, okay? So that means that it's going to be solid more easily, which is why you see a lowering of freezing point, okay? So all of these red molecules are in here and they are not shifting in and out like over here in this page, they're not going back to liquid, they're staying in solid. So it's gonna be very easy to get them all to go to solid. Okay, so they were already close together because of the IMFs between the solute and the solvent, and now it's gonna be much more easily to get them to stay together. Okay, it doesn't require near as much energy. Boiling point elevation, each mole of solute will raise the boiling point one of one kilogram of water by 0.51 degrees Celsius, okay? So this is sort of um, the opposite sort of deal here. So here you have liquid par particles in a pure solvent system can easily go into gas phase, but it's going to be harder to get these solute molecules to go into gas phase because of the IMFs between the solute and the solvent. So you're gonna have to add more energy to break these interactions to get it to go into um, uh, gas phase. Okay, so that means there is a elevation in the boiling point. It takes more energy to get these molecules to escape. Okay. All right, vapor pressure. Vapor pressure, um, when you're dealing with a non-volatile solvent, um, is going to lower the vapor pressure of a solution the more solute molecules you add. Okay. So what we mean by that is here you have a picture of pure solvent. They are easily going into vapor phase. And then when they get into vapor phase, uh, the pressure that they exert on a closed system would be their vapor pressure. Okay, they get an equilibrium between those going back to liquid and the liquid ones going to gas. The ones that are left exert a pressure on the container and that is called the vapor pressure. When you put solute molecules in here, which you see is the little red ones here, these solute molecules, again, are going to interact with um, the solvent molecules, and it's going to be harder to get them to go into vapor form, takes more energy. So when they reach equilibrium, there will be far fewer molecules, which will exert a lower pressure. So it's going to have a lower vapor pressure the more solute molecules you have. All right, here's a different look at it. So here you have pure solvent. Here you have some solute molecules. They are interacting and you see that you have fewer going into vapor phase, which results in a lower vapor pressure. All right, 
Um, we can talk about some of these things, specifically vapor pressure, uh, with the use of an equation. So here we have the Ryot law, which is uh, pressure of the solution is equal to the uh, mole fraction of the solvent times the pressure of the pure solvent. Okay, so we see that down here it tells us what all these little things stood for in case you didn't catch it. Okay, here's another way to write Rolt's Law, which is just an extension. Here you're using mole fraction of the solute times the pressure of the solute plus the mole fracture of the solvent times the uh, partial pressure of the solvent. You can do this because partial pressures and mole fractions are both additive. So you can use this to talk about everything in the solution if you desire. When a solution obeys Rayout's law, it's called a ideal solution. Okay, it behaves in an ideal manner um, that we can easily predict via our equation that we have. So we see as the partial pressure of B um, decreases, you have an increase in the mole fraction of A, and as the partial pressure of A decreases, you have an increase in the mole fraction of B, and then it shows you that the total vapor um, of pure A and pure B responds accordingly. All right, now you can have deviations from Rolt's law. When you have strong solute-solvent interactions, so high IMFs, you're gonna have a lower vapor pressure than you predicted. This should make sense because the stronger the IMFs, the harder it will be for those to escape and it's from the liquid phase into the vapor phase and therefore you have a lower vapor pressure, fewer escape, fewer can uh, exert a pressure on the container. All right, positive deviations are gonna be when you have weak interactions. So if you have very, very low IMF uh, solute solvent interactions, then you're gonna have a higher vapor pressure than what you would typically predict. All right, so the less IMFs you have, the higher your vapor pressure will be because more will escape more easily. You'll have more vapor pressures um, in vapor phase, and then they'll exert a higher pressure on the container. All right, here's another picture of it. So we know that water has a higher vapor pressure than the solution. Therefore, uh, the water is going to start to evaporate, and it's going to evaporate faster than the water from the solution. Okay, so the water that has this is water as well, but it has some solute molecules in it. The pure water is going to evaporate much faster than the um, solution that has some sol solute molecules in it. And then we see that over time, the water will condense, oops, we went too far, will condense faster in the air. Um, so all the solutions should all end up over here because fewer of them can escape vapor phase than over here, okay? All right, we have some practice problems that we're going to look at. So we have a solution of cyclopentene. Contains, excuse me, let me get my notebook pulled up. All right, so we have a non-volatile compound, cyclopentane, has a vapor pressure of 211. And if the vapor pressure of the pure liquid is 313, what's the mole fraction? All right, so we're just going to use our well, we would if we could get the computer to respond. <laughs> All right, so let's see. So our vapor pressure of solution. Ooh. That is not looking very pretty. There we go is 212 tor. Okay, and our vapor pressure of our pure liquid, so it's gonna be P, this should be a P. I was thinking vapor pressure in rho to V, that's a P, okay. Still pretty now. Vapor pressure of the pure solvent is gonna be 313, and we need to know our mole fraction. Okay, so we've got our equation, which is P of the solution is equal to the mole fraction times the pressure of the pure solvent. Okay, so we got 212 equals mole fraction 
times 313. Divide by 313. So you got 212 divided by 313. And our mole fraction is 0.674. Okay. All right, here's another problem. So we see that we have 45 grams of C6H12O6, which is glucose, and 72 grams of H2O wants to know um, the vapor pressure of the solution if the vapor pressure of pure water is 38.84. Okay, so first we're going to need to use these grams to get us some more useful information. So we're going to find the mole fraction. But first, we must get to moles. Okay, so this is our glucose. We're going to put the molar mass of the glucose on the bottom, which is 180.1608. Okay, and that's uh, equal to a mole. All right, so the mole fraction is going to be, let's see, that's not mole fraction. That's our moles. Let's see, 0.25 moles. Okay, and this is our solute. Okay, and then we're going to have to add our solvent. Solvent, we have 72 grams. Molar mass of water is 18.0158. One mole on top. And we have 3.9965. moles of solvent. Okay, all right now to the mole fraction. So mole fraction is going to be your moles of solute over your total moles of solution. So we must add 0.25 and 3.9965 to get our total moles of solution. We're going to round it to 4.25 divide and we get 0 0.059 okay and that's the mole fraction okay and then we know that the vapor pressure of pure water so it's going to be our p prime is equal to 23.8 all right and we're going to plug this into our equation Here's the equation. Okay, she already forgot. All right, so we're looking for our P of solution. We know that our mole fraction is 0 0.059 and that our partial pressure, or uh, yeah, partial pressure of the pure solvent is 23.8. Multiply, and you get 1.4. Alright, and that's your pressure of the solution.